إلى رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله. Okay, Alhamdulillah, we have we've had a, a brief introduction to Rokia. Now, inshaAllah, we're going to look at the Raqi and his family. The Raqi and his family. So, to begin with, I want to mention some of the things that we as Raqis, some characteristics, some qualities that the Raqi he needs to possess. The first thing, and we start as the Prophet ﷺ started, Aqeedah. Your Aqeedah must be set. We mentioned in the Aqeedah course or the Aqeedah module yesterday some important issues, but subhanAllah, the Aqeedah of Islam is vast and we as Muslims, we need to know our Aqeedah inside out. We need to know those, uh, those, those points of Aqeedah which is vital for every single Muslim to know and we need to be well versed in our Aqeedah. So this is the first thing, this is the foundation, this is the shield, this is the force field around the Raqi bi'idhnillahi ta'ala is his knowing the correct Aqeedah. We cannot emphasize this enough, ya ikhwan. If we had the, the, the opportunity to split this, uh, this, this course over six weeks, we'd probably dedicate like a whole week, two weeks, if we had the, the ability to do so, to Aqeedah. To make sure that our Aqeedah was on point, to make sure that we knew what we needed to know, and to make sure that this, our protection was you know, was at the right level. The second thing that the Raqi needs to have is ikhlas. You need to be doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This is going to make a huge difference to the effective, effectiveness of your ruqya bi idhnillahi ta'ala. You're not doing it for wealth, you're not doing it for women, you're not doing it for fame, or power, you are doing it for the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The third thing that the Raqi needs to have is istiqama in Islam, in the religion. We need to be upright. We need to be firm and upright in this deen. We need to be following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the best of our ability. The fourth thing that the Raqi he needs to do is he needs to do this to the best of his ability because if anything is going to overcome him it will be this thing he needs to abstain from sinning to the best of his ability he needs to be staying away from the major sins he needs to be trying his best to minimize those minor sins because with these sins this is what the shayateen they are going to use to overcome him due to these sins perhaps Cracks may develop in his armor, in his protection, and as a result of this, the shayateen, they will be able to overpower this individual. But ya ikhwan, we need to mention something here, and this is that we need to be practical. This doesn't mean that if you sin here, you sin there, now you can no longer be Iraqi. Nobody is saying, you know, achieve perfection before you do ruqya, because none of us is going to achieve this. As the Prophet ﷺ, he said, all of the sons of Adam, they sin. All of the sons of Adam, they make mistakes. And the best of those who sin are those who repent. So abstain from sin and increase in your repentance. The Raqi should be somebody who he is constantly turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. He is constantly asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. He is constantly asking Allah Jalla wa ala for pardon for those mistakes which he has committed. The fifth thing is that the Raqi, he needs to be strong in Iman. He needs to be somebody who he has tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is placing his full trust and reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single Rukya session, potentially the Raqi is placing himself in a position of danger. He is going to be tackling those shayateen, he is going to be placed in front of those devils who they don't want any benefit to come to this individual. They only want harm. So he is constantly placing himself 
in a position of danger to help his brother and sister. He is constantly placing himself in a position of danger to make the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the highest. So the Raqi needs to have firm conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He needs to go into that session placing his trust and reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and he needs to know that Allah is enough for him. He needs to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will suffice him. Put your trust in Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for you. The sixth thing that the Raqi he needs to possess is a strong, strong belief in the Quran and the correct aqidah that the Quran is shifa. He needs to know those ayat about the Quran. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لا رأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. If we reveal this Quran onto a mountain, you would see it turn to dust out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa taala. He needs to know these ayat. He needs to constantly reflect upon these ayat. So when he's in a difficult situation and Shaytan is whispering to him and saying, you know, this Quran that you're reciting is not enough. It's not having any effect. He needs to remember the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He needs to remember the strength and the power of this Qur'an. And he needs to have firm aqidah in the shifa that comes from reciting this Qur'an. The seventh thing that the Raqi he needs to possess is a basic understanding of the fiqh relating to Ruqya. He needs to understand is it permissible for me to touch? Is it permissible for me to do this? Can I do this? Can't I do this? He needs to have a basic understanding of the fiqh relating to the actual ruqya session. Is it permissible to, for me to be alone with a woman? What if the woman, she doesn't have a mahram? She's a revert and all of her family have abandoned her. Now she is suffering. What do I do in this situation when she needs ruqya? What should I do in this situation? Inshallah, we'll mention this in the next module. What should be done with regards to the fiqh, the general understanding of ruqya and those, uh, those, those situations that will arise within the ruqya session? Is it permissible for me to touch? What about if she's coming to attack me? So we need to understand the basic, uh, you know, we need to have a basic understanding of these issues. The eighth thing, what we have mentioned, is that he needs to enjoy the good and be forbidding the evil in general. In general, in his life, he needs to be somebody who is enjoying the good, forbidding the evil. In particular, he needs to enjoy the good and forbid the evil with his patient, but also, what the Sheikh has mentioned, with the jinn as well. You need to enjoy the good, forbid the evil with the jinn as well as the patient. But what's the limit now? What's the limit now? Is, is, is the limit when the jinn speaks? Now suddenly, you know, we, we start with the, uh, with the khutbah al-hajah, inna alhamdulillah, and then we do a, a full khutbah, and we no longer recite Qur'an? No, there needs to be a limit. Inshallah, we'll discuss this again uh, in the next module, which is the ruqya session. So this is the eighth thing. You need to be somebody who is enjoying the good, forbidding the evil. If the sister comes, she's not observing the correct hijab, you need to explain this to her. This will have a direct link on her, on her recovery. Because there may be a sin that a person is indulging in and as a result of that, the shifa does not come down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take the holistic approach, enjoin the good, forbid the evil. As we mentioned, you need to be giving da'wah to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The ninth thing, a characteristic of the Raqi, is he needs to act in accordance with the Qur'an and the Sunnah within his Rukya session. So his Rukya session, it needs to be in accordance with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. We mentioned those nine forms of Rukya, which we have said and we've proven from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You need to stick to the Sunnah, and the closer that you stick to the Sunnah, the more effective your Rukya session will be. The tenth thing, the Raqi needs to conceal what happens within that Rukya session. Perhaps he will, due to a, a wrestling and struggling of the shaitan, the sister's hijab will become, un, uh, you know, would come off. Her head covering will come off. Perhaps he may see something. Perhaps the jinn will speak and try and expose the individual. Mention some of their sins. 
On this day he did such and such and such and such. The Raqi, he needs to be somebody who he is concealing his brothers and sisters. He's not opening this up. He doesn't get his video camera out and put it and, and you know show the brother or sister struggling and then he puts it all over the internet and the, there is no privacy left for this individual. The eleventh thing that the Raqi needs to possess he needs to be a person who has gentle, uh, a gentle character with regards to his brother or sister who is suffering. Don't be rough and tough. This person has come to you, they are suffering, they, have, they want some support from you, they want some words of encouragement. Encourage your brother and sister. Encourage them with patience. Encourage them with perseverance. Encourage them that, you know, look, this, there, there is a cure. Give them words of encouragement. Be gentle with regards to this. Don't make your patient despair. The last thing you want to say to, to your patient is, SubhanAllah, I've never come across sihar so difficult to treat. SubhanAllah, your jinn is on another level. Because you're going to then make your patient despair. This person, the shaitan is going to come and whisper to them, there's no cure for you. He's never come across anything so difficult. And you're never going to get better. You're going to make your person, your patient, fall into a state of despair. Give them words of encouragement. Give them words of encouragement. Some characteristics, some personality traits that should be found within the Raqi. You need to be somebody who's quick on your feet. You need to be able to think under pressure. If, you know, subhanAllah, this jinn starts speaking, you need to know what to do now in this situation. You're going to find yourself in situations which are ajeeb. You've never come across them before. This person, he looks like he's choking to death. What do you do in this situation? So subhanAllah, you need to be quick on your feet. You need to be quick on your feet. Perhaps this bottle, it lifts itself up and, and floats across the room. You need to be quick on your feet. You need to know what to do. Your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it needs to be absolute. You need to have complete reliance in Allah jalla wa ala. The Raqi needs to understand that there is no protection that he can offer to himself. The protection is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he understands this, then his tawakkul in Allah, his reliance upon Allah is going to be more complete. He knows now at the beginning of the session, there's nothing that I can do to benefit myself. I can't see this jinn. I can't protect myself from the jinn. All I can do is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect me, put my trust, my reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is complete reliance and this is what the raqi he needs to have. The Raqi needs to be somebody who is aware. You need to be aware. You don't want to be somebody who's very lazy in your Rukya session. So you just sit there and you relax. No, you need to be aware. You're going into a struggle with the Shayateen. There may be a little sign or a little symptom which is very, very subtle. And you'll only pick up on it if you're aware, if you're awake. You need to be in this situation where you understand, I am going now to struggle against the shaitan. I need all of my concentration. I need all of my powers of, of awareness so that I can uh, you know, go into this battle. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he mentions, As for he who sets about repelling their evil in the just manner which Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded, he has not oppressed them. Rather, he is obedient to Allah and his messenger in helping the oppressed, supporting the one in desperate need, and removing the grief of the suffering by the Islamic means, which does not contain making a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor does it contain oppression of the creation. This type of person will not be harmed by the jinn. This type of person will not be harmed by the jinn, either because they know that he is just, or because they are simply unable to do so, even though it may be that some of the ifrit, some of the very powerful ones, they may harm him in a minor way. The Raqi needs to understand this. I am being just. I am establishing the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am making his word the highest. And I am being just. So the jinn, they're not going to harm me, either because they understand that I am being just, 
or because they simply cannot harm me because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the my protector Allah jalla wa ala, I am struggling in the cause of Allah I have my trust in Allah my reliance is upon Allah I am turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of this the shayateen they're not going to be able to harm me but Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he mentions even though some of the ifrit some of the very powerful ones they may cause him minor harm we're going to talk about this in the next module inshallah whilst you're reciting perhaps you get a twitch maybe you get a bit of a headache you get a bit of an earache or a throat ache or your jaw you know starts hurting or you're holding the mushaf and suddenly your arm goes dead and you have to catch the mushaf with the other hand this is the ifrit or the the jinn the shayateen they're trying to cause you some harm but subhanallah look how pathetic it is look how little uh, control they have over you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting you the best thing that they can do is make your arm twitch the best thing that they can do is poke you here and there subhanallah and this is because you are under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he mentions so it is befitting for this person to protect himself by reading the last two surahs of the Quran and through prayer and dua and the other things that strengthen iman he must also avoid the sins which can overtake him by which the shayateen will overtake him so because of his sins the shayateen will be able to overtake him for he is a mujahid for the sake of Allah and this is from the greatest forms of jihad so he should be careful lest the enemy overcomes him through his sins this is what Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he said be careful because you are a mujahid in the path of Allah and this is from the greatest forms of jihad but be careful because you're going to come in contact with the shayateen lest they overtake you as a result of your sins so we have mentioned protecting yourself protecting yourself now I want to mention protecting your home protecting your home the Raqi you're going to go out you're going to recite on people the shayateen they're going to try everything and anything in their way to try and uh, you know, deter you from this field of Rukya. Number one, your home, it should be a place of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your home should be a place where Allah is mentioned. Your home should be a place where Allah is glorified and Allah is exalted and Allah is praised and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sought. The Messenger alayhi salatu salam, he said the example, or the, the, the example of those who remember Allah and those who do not is like the example of the living and the dead. This is the difference between those people. The difference between those who remember Allah and those who do not is like those who are dead and those who are living. Make sure that your house is your home is a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is glorified. There should be no pictures on display in your home. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that the angels will not enter into a home where there are pictures on display or there is a dog. Where there is a dog or there are pictures on display. Once the Messenger ﷺ, he was waiting for Jibreel السلام, And Jibreel السلام, had told him that he would come down at a certain time to meet the Messenger ﷺ. But Jibreel السلام, he never came. He never came. When the Prophet وسلم, he became a bit agitated. What's going on here? They looked and there was a small puppy under the bed. There was a small puppy under the bed. As a result of that, Jibreel alayhi salam, he never came to meet this, the Messenger So you need to understand, if you have pictures on display, anything ya ikhwan, pictures of your children, pictures of your wedding day, pictures of uh, living animals, horses, whatever it might be. There should be no pictures or faces on display to the best of your ability in your home. There should be no dogs in your home because the angels of Allah, they will not enter into your home. And of course, where the angels do not enter, then perhaps the shayateen, they will enter. Where there are angels, you will not find shayateen. Where there are no angels, perhaps the shayateen, they will enter. There should be no music in your home. Nobody should be listening to music in your home. 
But again, ya ikhwan, as our brother Hafizahullah he mentioned, do what you are able to. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. If you're living with somebody and he's listening to music and you know, you're sharing a home, whatever it may be, then at least make your bedroom a place where the shayateen will not enter. At least make what you have control over, do what, was, what is it within your ability. If it's your home, make sure that there is no music in your home. How can you expect your home to be a place where the shayateen do not want to go when you are listening to the music, when you are listening to the words of the shaytan? When you are listening to the words of shaytan, it is going to invite the shayateen into your home. So listen to the words of Allah, make the, your home a place where the words of Allah can be heard and not where the words of shaitan will be heard. There, will be, there should be no taweez, no amulets in your home. No taweez, no amulets in your home. It's extremely important. Perhaps you have some, you have forgotten about them. But one exception is if you are doing ruqya on people, you bring your, their amulets home and you destroy them there. We have mentioned that this is disliked. The sheikh uh, Sheikh Adil, Hafizahullah, he disliked this. But this is something that I do. When the people come to my home and I, dist- I take the amulets off them. I don't say to them, go outside and leave your amulets outside. Rather, I want to save my brothers and sisters from shirk as soon as I can. Give it to me. Just give it to me. And I take it off them. And then, of course, I will destroy it within the home. Within the home. But if you can go outside and destroy it, this is even better. But there should be no amulets within your home unless they are there for a temporary period awaiting destruction. When you enter into your home, say Bismillah. When your children enter into your, their, your home, train them and teach them to say Bismillah. If they haven't said Bismillah, tell them to go back outside, enter with your right foot and say Bismillah. We need to get ourselves into this good habit. Why did we mention the hadith that we were talking about? If the person, he enters and he doesn't say Bismillah, what does shaitan say? You have a place to stay. You have a place to stay. So enter into your home, say Bismillah. Tell your children to say Bismillah. Enter with the right foot, say Bismillah. When you close the door, say Bismillah. When you lock your doors, say Bismillah. Why? The shayateen, as we mentioned in that hadith yesterday, they cannot enter into a home or through a door which is locked and the name of Allah has been mentioned over it. Do you see this knowledge which we were talking about yesterday? How it is now the practical implementation of such knowledge. The practical side of this knowledge is now being implemented. (coughs) Alhamdulillah. When your children eat, when you eat, say Bismillah. Train them, teach them to say Bismillah. And if they forget, then teach them the dua, which is what you should say if you forget. So subhanallah, we are teaching our children to say bismillah. Why? Because that hadith, again, which we mentioned yesterday, in the theory side, when the person, he enters and he doesn't say bismillah, shaitan says, you have a place to sleep tonight. And then he eats and he doesn't say bismillah, shaitan says, you have a place to eat and you have a place to sleep tonight. So your house is just like a hotel for the shayateen. So make sure that there is no place to eat, there is no place to stay in your home. Remove anything that will earn the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just try and be as obedient as you can within your home. Earning or seeking to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay now, protecting your children. The Raqi, he has a child or he has children. He wants to protect his children from the influence of the shayateen. The first thing, and we always start with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, is to put your hands over the head and then recite the dua, which can be found in Fortress of a Muslim and elsewhere, which he would recite over Hassan and Hussein. Radiallahu anhu. I seek refuge in you in the perfect words of Allah. For you, for every single, uh, for every evil devil, etc., for every evil eye, any insect which will sting you. So again, we are seeking refuge in Allah for our children because they are too young. But the second that they can speak and they can learn these du'as, you teach them these du'as and you teach them to seek refuge in Allah for themselves. 
When they are asleep, every night before they go to sleep, you should be reciting you know, Surah Ikhlas, Surah Falaq, Surah Nas three times each, and then you should be blowing and passing, the, passing your hands over their bodies, as Aisha radiallahu anha, she did for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he wasn't able to do so himself. Of course, Ayatul Kursi, and of course, Ya Ikhwan, teach them from as soon as they are able to learn about the Aqeedah of Islam. Where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Teach them to point up and say above the heavens. Just these little, little things that we can do with our children who are two years old even. Planting the seed of the correct aqidah, this is going to protect them bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. As a raqi, you yourself, don't become chuffed with yourself. Don't become like amazed with yourself. I'm so amazing. I go out, I fight the shayateen with the words of Allah. Don't let kibr and arrogance and pride enter into your heart. The second this happens, you are going to become much weaker. The second this happens, your ruqya is going to become much less effective. You should be constantly seeking knowledge of Islam. Your house should be one where you are constantly reading books, you are seeking knowledge, you are enga engaging in you know, good remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You invite the brothers around. Again, we take a holistic approach. We are constantly seeking this type of thing. We should be reciting Surah Al-Baqarah in our homes at least once every three days. Surah Al-Baqarah should be recited in your home at least once every three days. Just constantly reciting Surah Al-Baqarah. As we mentioned, as our brother mentioned, Hafizahullah, about the, the virtues of Surat al Baqarah, how the, 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 the magicians they cannot stand in front of Surat al Baqarah. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, Do not turn your homes into the graves. Do not make your homes into graves. Verily, Shaytan, he does not enter the house where Surat al Baqarah it is recited. Shaytan will not enter the home in which Surat al Baqarah it is recited. And we have practical examples. You will begin to live this hadith, subhanallah. When you see and you engage in ruqya and you are reciting Surah Al-Baqarah and asking Allah for protection, by Allah, my dear brothers and sisters, when a person is afflicted with jinn possession and there is a shaitan with them, you will find that shaitan doesn't even want to set foot in your home. He doesn't even want to set foot in your home. And this is living proof of the truthfulness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we have mentioned some characteristics of the Raqi. You should just be struggling and striving to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in encompassing this, then we have, you will have you know, all of these qualities that we have mentioned. All of these qualities, they will be found within you. Now I want to mention some characteristics found in the one who is being recited over. So the one that you are reciting over, what are some of the characteristics that this individual must have? What did we mention? The Raqi, first and foremost, you are giving da'wah to Allah and His Messenger. So you should be mentioning these things at the beginning of your Ruqya session. Or at the end of your Ruqya session, you should be giving da'wah to these things. The first thing is giving da'wah to the correct Aqeedah. Calling that person to the Aqeedah of Islam, the Aqeedah of the Salaf al-Salih. Before you start, make sure that you are giving them da'wah to the correct Aqeedah. Wallahi, sometimes the person sits in my house and the first thing that I say is, tell me, where is Allah? And from this, I can gauge the level of the person's aqidah. If they say Allah is everywhere, then I need to start from the basics. We need to start teaching this person aqidah. Recommend some good books of aqidah to them. I want you to read this. I want you to read this. I want you to read this. There have even been occasions when me, myself, personally, I have said to an individual, I've gauged what their level is like, and I've said, look, I will not do ruqya on you until you read this book. Because your aqidah is so all over the place that the ruqya subhanallah when I recite we may get somewhere by the permission of Allah you go away you think Allah is everywhere you think we can call upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the dead etc you take two steps forward when we are doing ruqya and then you take ten steps backwards so recommend some good texts some short you know advices that the person should go away and read again you are giving da'wah before you have even started your ruqya 
The second thing, remind the person about ikhlas. Remind them about their sincerity. Remind them to have you know, complete reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They need to understand that you yourself cannot benefit them, nor can you harm them. You cannot benefit them, nor can you harm them. It's a trademark, you know, a, a part of my ruqya, part of my ruqya routine is I say, right, I'm going to bring the re- build the recitation now. I want you to listen attentively, put your trust in Allah, and do not put your trust in me. Know that I cannot benefit you in anything, nor can I uh, bring you any harm, except with what Allah has already written. So put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to encourage them to be upright and firm in this religion. We need to encourage them to try and follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Even if it's a brother, you encourage him, Yaqi, you look good with a beard. Yaqi, you should dress like this. You should you should speak like this. These are how you know these things. Follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Encourage them to abstain from sinning. Stay away from sin. Remind them that it may be one sin that they are engaged in which prevents the shifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from reaching them. As a result of that one sin, Allah does not send down that shifa. Allah does not send down that shifa. We need them to have complete tawakkul, uh, complete reliance in this Quran. We need to really drill it in that look, this Quran, it is enough. All of those people who you've been to have been going and giving you fancy things and doing fancy remedies. Look, none of it has worked. Now come and put your trust in Allah. Listen to the Quran and let's, you know, let's use the Quran how it should be used. We also need to advise the patient to be patient. Advise the one who has come to you to be patient. This companion in that hadith, he did ruqya for three days in the morning and in the evening. He didn't just do ruqya once and blow on the, or spit in the area and then say, right, now you're cured. Or the person didn't say, well, why am I not getting better? No, for three whole days, the companion in the morning and in the evening, he was reciting. Some people, they come and they say, why am I not getting better? What's wrong? Why me? And then I always turn to them and say, this is why. The fact that you've just said this, perhaps this is a reason why. Because your aqidah is not correct. You do not understand the qadr and the decree of Allah. And you are being hasty. Allah will send it, the, the shifa down whenever He wills. So again, the Raqi and his family, Ya Ikhwan, we need to understand that the protection is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constantly make dua that Allah protects you, Allah guides you from being misguided, Allah protects you from the plots and the plans of the shayateen. Complete reliance in Allah, seeking or doing that which He loves and staying away from that which He hates.